హలో స్టూడెంట్స్ వెల్కమ్ టు ఈ పీజీ పాఠశాల ఐ ఆమ్ డాక్టర్ డివి ప్రసాద్ ఫ్రమ్ ఇందిరాగాంధీ నేషనల్ ట్రైబల్ యూనివర్సిటీ అమర్కంఠ టుడే వీ విల్ డిస్కస్ అబౌట్ ద మోడ్యూల్ ఎకనామిక్ ఎక్స్చేంజ్ ఫ్రమ్ పేపర్ సోషల్ కల్చరల్ ఆంథ్రోపాలజీ లెట్ అస్ సీ వాట్ వీ ఆర్ గోయింగ్ టు టు స్టడీ ఇన్ దిస్ మోడ్యూల్ ఫస్ట్ టు స్టడీ ద కాన్సెప్ట్ ఎకనామిక్ ఆంథ్రోపాలజీ anthropology and economics the general relation of production to distribution exchange and utilization economic anthropology in just over four decades the field of study now known as economic anthropology has evolved from nameless embryonic idea to a recognized quasi revolutionary sub discipline of social cultural anthropology in the 1920s few scholars devoted special attention to the general problems common to economics and anthropology today there is considerable debate among its sectarianized practitioners as to whether the term economic anthropology should continue to denote its original meaning in his seminal essay nsp grass an economic historian coined the term economic anthropology and conceived of its it as a synthesis of anthropological and economic studies which entailed the study of the ways in which primitive peoples obtained a living grass distinguished economic anthropology from anthropological economics which he defined as the study of ideas that the primitive peoples held about economic matters among his suggestions for future research the was collaboration between anthropologists and economists so that anthropologists could provide those in the economic field with facts in return for ideas and the fundamental issues involved in getting a living anthropology and economics the mainstream of work in economic anthropology today is characterized by a growing spirit of cross fertilization and collaboration between economists and anthropologists a spirit that has been concretely manifested in a series of publications like Raymond Forth and Yami in 1964 Raymond Forth edited volume in 1967 Lee Claire Snyder 1968 Wharton 1969 Brookfield 1969 Laughlin 1970 This spirit is a relatively recent phenomena especially from the standpoint of economics in an incisive essay comparing the scope and method of economics and anthropology written in 1960 the economist joseph berliner was apologetic for the constricted perspective of his colleagues who when engaging themselves in the study of comparative economic systems habitually considered only the variant forms of western industrial economic systems doubtless he argued that this habit did not merit the stigma of being categorized as ethnocentrism but rather was simply a natural intellectual response by economists to the analytical complexities and possibilities of western institutional field berliner reasoned that economists of a decade ago were willing to forego knowledge about relations between changes in other economic variables and changes in other cultural variables as well as about culturally specific versus universal properties of economic systems in order to acquire a more intense and precise understanding of the systematic regularities among economic themselves 
economic anthropology. Unlike many other formalists, Adel emphasizes three special requirements and limitations of economic analysis. First and foremost is there are three elements that must be stipulated before such an analysis can begin. A. Preference function a mathematical representation of the things actors in the economic process desire to obtain or maximize. B. Resources availability and ownership patterns and C. Technical production or exchange possibilities reference may be found in Lee, Clare and Schneider 1968 page number 457 to 59. There is no way to deal with diachronic dimension of the function that is economic analysis is purely synchronic. The economic process may not be the only system relating values, technology and resource ownership. Consequently, complementary types of analysis are required to provide complete coverage of relevant relationships. Because of these requirements and limitations, Edel contents economic analysis cannot cannibalize the traditional domains of other social sciences. Quite the contrary, he argues that the field of economic anthropology is necessary and viable precisely because economic analysis cannot rope effectively with intrapersonal relations and relations between customs which are the focus of anthropology. Edel concludes his essay by proposing that economic anthropology deals with the economic process of matching the resources to targets with reference to the social milieu to which it is fitted. A growing number of economic anthropologists share this view of the scope of the discipline. The general relations of production to distribution, exchange and utilization. Production yields good adapted to our needs. Distribution distributes them according to social laws. Exchange distributes further what has already been distributed according to individual wants. Finally, in consumption, the product drops out of the social movement, becoming the direct object of the individual want, which it serves and satisfies in use. Production thus appears as the starting point, consumption as the final end, and distribution and exchange as the middle. The latter has a double aspect, distribution being defined as a process carried on by society while exchange as one proceeding from the individual. These relationships are not without their ambiguities. For example, production implies consumption in the sense of using of the means of production just as consumption implies production in the sense of nutritive process through which means consume foodstuffs so as. In fact, in effect, to produce their own bodies, yet these ambiguities can lead to new sites and may reinforce the validity of the categories as a general framework of analysis. This seems to be true in those instances when they have been systematically applied in the analysis of economic life in pre-industrial societies. In economic anthropology, Maurice Godelier argues persuasively for the concept of production as a departure point for synchronic and diachronic analysis, defining production as the totality of operations which supply a society with its material means of existence. He argues that it encompasses all operations of this type regardless of the specific societal context 
in which they are performed. Thus, hunting, gathering, and fishing economies in which man occupies nature and exploit it without transforming it, as well as more advanced agricultural and industrial economies in which material necessities are produced by transforming nature are included within the same analytical framework. In a formal sense, the modes of production in these societies are reducible to an identical series of relationships to produce in all cases entails a combination of certain technical rules, raw materials or resources, tools and human labor to obtain a product that is socially beneficial. This is in essence what economists call the production function, a functional mix of the factors of production which takes different forms according to the nature of the variables and the possible ways of combining them in a given society. Distribution and exchange. This section includes separate discussions of two processes that anthropologists often lump together. Distribution and exchange. As we saw earlier, Distribution determines the proportion of total output that the individual will receive, whereas exchange determines the specific products into which the individual wants to convert the share allocated to him by distribution. Distribution implies a reward system in which produce is channeled out among individuals or groups by reason of their control over the factors of production or for the labor they expanded in the productive process. Exchange on other hand refers to the various process by which goods move between individuals or groups as for example between producer and consumer, buyer and seller, donor and recipient. From the standpoint of your functional analysis, these two processes are closely interrelated in all societies, but there is a higher degree of correspondence between them in band and tribal societies than in more advanced pre-industrial and industrial societies. In every society, the producer-product relation, once the product is finished, it is not necessarily are immediately one of position. The return of the product to the individual depends on his relation to the other individuals. More precisely, the distribution process intervenes between the producer and his product to establish his share in total output according to prevailing norms. Every society has explicit or implicit norms governing the way its total pool of products is to be shared out among its members. It is analytically important, however, to remember that sharing out behavior is a process guided only partly by norms, not simply a series of acts in response to norms. It may turn out that producer of a given product has a primary claim on it but this always depend on the prevailing distribution system. Thus the primary climate might be a non-producer who is trustee or steward, administrator, owner, boss, lineage head, a reluctant distributor of largesse or a benevolent despot. Whatever the outcome of a given distribution process, it must revolve around some person or persons. In hunting societies, for example, when a number of hunters cooperate to kill a utilizable animal, there are strict rules for ascribing ownership of that animal to only the hunter who distributes its parts among the others. Again, in accordance with the recognized norms, likewise, in fishing societies, when a number of fishermen work together on a fishing expedition, 
that is the owner of the boat or net who usually distribute the catch. Although gift giving has a larger place than market transactions, buying and selling, exchange with a view to a good bargain in the economy of societies of simple technology, they are by no means lacking in markets in the concrete sense that is appointed places where people meet to say exchange goods. One could say that the beach where the Kula canoes land is a marketplace for those members of the crew who are not taking part in the ceremonial exchange. And just as the Kula exchange is a means of establishing peaceful contacts between peoples who without it would take mutual enmity for granted. So, is a marketplace where persons belonging to otherwise hostile groups can meet on amicable terms. The political significance of the marketplace may be equal to its economic significance as a recognized point where goods can be exchanged. Trading Partnerships A trading partnership exists when relations between a particular buyer and a particular seller or giver and receiver persist beyond a single transaction. Such partnerships are widespread in non-market economies that is those without marketplaces are organized factor and commodity markets and with no all-purpose money are undergoing monetization where they are a major trading mechanism involve individual traders in material transactions with real and fictive kinsmen, FN or friends. They are also found in monetized peasant market economies where they serve as effective means of adapting to the risks and uncertainties inherent in competitive trading. A common type of partnership in peasant market economies is based on the extension of credit by one of the parties. Transaction in the marketplace between partners whether based on the extension of credit or not. Do not preclude haggling whereas those conducted in non-market economies often preclude. It in favor of balanced reciprocity or barter according to the prevailing notions of set equivalences. Even in non-monetary economies, however, there is evidence to suggest that superior knowledge or skill on the part of one trader may be exercised to considerable material advantages over his partner. Finally, it appears that individual trading partner relationships cannot be properly understood without tracing the total network of relationships in which both partners are enmeshed with the others in the same group and that the terms of trade of any one set of traders must be studied in the context of this total network of relationships much as economists handle international trading relations. Intercommunity trade involves the acquisition of products that is foodstuffs, raw materials or manufactured goods which are unavailable in the importing community. Such a trade often reflects permanent intercommunity or inter-regional production specializations and always arise through mutual interest in comparative advantage, each trading unit gaining materially or symbolically. Since this trade customarily requires traveling considerable distances across political or ethnic boundaries, the potential for hostility and conflict is high thus creating a need 
for peacekeeping or solidarity promoting mechanisms various modes of inter community trade are found in the ethnographic record including silent trade visiting trade for example extension of generalized reciprocity to inter community sector administered trade and extension of market systems with or without itinerant middlemen archaeological research yields no evidence of regular inter community trade before the end of pleistocene but scattered data suggest the existence of sporadic trade in non subsistence goods during the late pleistocene and early post pleistocene intra community distribution economic transactions between an individual distributor and many receivers within a single community in so far as they occur regularly and involve the circulation of a significant proportion of total goods produced characterize band and tribal societies such distributions typically are restricted to food stuffs and like ceremonial gift exchanges usually generate a deferred counter flow of equivalent goods thus the circulatory process in this type of inter community distribution approximates the general pattern of economic exchange goods changing hands in an initial act of distribution result in a return flow to the distributor of goods different from yet equivalent to those originally given in other words the distributor disposes of goods that he can or won't consume himself the goods that are often products of his own labor and obtains in return a claim on the future output of others distributive acts of this kind while not occurring under conditions of prolonged anomalous food shortage do serve to even out the impact of temporary shortages or differences in output between households which to greater or lesser degree characterize all primitive and peasant economies sharing through distributive acts however is by no means a culturally imperative mode of adaptation to conditions of food scarcity in many societies it appears to be one advantages way of coping with inadequate technology for the storage and preservation of perishable food stuffs ceremonial prestations regularly occur in all societies but quantitatively and functionally they are considerable the more important in primitive and peasant societies where they are often associated with life cycle celebrations or feastings related to other social or political events moss study for example includes illustrative cases of ceremonial prestations in samoa new zealand andaman islands melanesia northwest north america ancient rome the hindu classical period and feudal germanic societies gift given in small scale societies follow the same principle you do not haggle you accept what you have you are given with ceremonious politeness gnashing your teeth in private if it is not what you expected and it is left entirely to you to decide the appropriate return of course there is a general notion of the relative value of different objects as there is a general awareness of what people will consider mean if we see gift giving in western society in this light if we realize that it is not a spontaneous expression of affection by the giver but a socially expected component of certain relationships we shall be halfway to understanding of its significance for peoples of simple 
technology the kula one of the most famous gift exchange institutions is the kula which was first described in detail by malnoski and which appears to be a similar in essentials to many other systems in melanesia and australia in the trobriand islands where malnoski work every man who can form partnership for the exchange of shell ornaments with other men in his own and in other islands these ornaments are of two kinds necklaces of red shell and armlets of white shell the exchange is not a single transaction in which both partners give and receive when they meet the one whose turn it is make a gift the return gift is made at their next meeting if the partners are neighbors the two meetings may follow close on one another's heels but the spectacular part of the exchange takes place when people travel by canoe to visit other partners in other islands exchanges are not made in all directions but in a fixed order like a grand chain in a in a dance each man's overseas partners are in the islands on either side of his own and each man receives necklace from the partners on one side and armlets from those on the other the most highly prized of these objects are named and some are so highly valued that the history of the men who have possessed them and their whereabouts at any given time is known a man who knows that one of these is on its way to his home is likely inwardly to be eagerly calculating his chance of getting it but no one may retain possession of a kula object for long for a little time he has it to boost up and wear on ceremony location then it must go on to one of his partners you can see the kula exchange from the picture where tobrian islands were shown these gifts are transferred in clockwise and anti clockwise direction you can see the gifts in another picture the port latch just as the tobrian kula is a particularly well studied example of an institution that is found over very wide area of melanesia so the port latch of the southern kwakitul of british columbia is the most fully documented instance of an exchange system that is characteristics of four people of the american northwest the haida klingit simishan and the kwakitul but the documentation of the two systems illustrate the contrast between old and new theoretical assumptions and methods of field work malnoski functional approach had as one of its principles that one should look logical coherence and systems in the behavior one observe and thus find a relation rational for the institutions in question boas recorded what he saw and was told in most painstaking detail but since he believed that culture was a haphazard collection of traits he did not look for coherence his records tell more of what the kwakatil thought about the potlatch than what they actually did and the later anthropologists have had difficulty in picturing it as what malnoski would have called a going concern however a new reading of the data based largely on the recollections of two indians who had been active in potlatching in the past enable us to see it in in this way potlatch means give and the principle of deserves a counter gift was important in this institution as in the kula 
but it had significance beyond that of linking pairs of individuals in relation of friendship. A potlatch was a public distribution of goods made both to establish certain claims of the giver and to recognize the claims of the recipients. The coquetel had an elaborate ranking system which placed every man in order according to his degree of closeness in descent to the remotest remembered ancestor. The line of eldest sons was senior and provided the chiefs of the different descent groups. Chiefs had special ritual privileges, titles and the right to use songs, dances, carved masks and so forth. But in order to demonstrate his claim to this, that is the claim to be a chief, a man had to give a potlatch at which he recalled the famous potlatches and other deeds of his ancestors and made the distribution to guests in strict order of rank. Thus, he proved both that the commanded enough wealth to be able to give it away and that he was properly informed about the accepted order of rank. As the coquetel came to earn money and so acquire wealth from outside the system, lesser men began to potlatch and now it became the rule that a man who had previously made a present to the giver should get a larger gift in return. Even if this was out of the proportion to his rank order, rivals for a title or for pre precedence would assert their claim by trying to outdo each other in the amounts they distributed. So students, let us summarize what we have learned from this module. You learned about definitions and characteristics of primitive economy, also knew the stages of economy and also we discussed about the different types of hunting and gathering and hunting by weapons, traps, snares, engaging tamed animals and poisoning etc. Identify the different types of fishing like fishing by nets, poisoning, weapons, engaging tamed animals etc. In addition to the all these cited above, you also understood one the other stages like herding, foraging, agriculture, horticulture and pastoralism etc. along with the changes noticed in simple economy. Thanks.